My esteemed colleague and friend, Tucker Childs, I remember him from the olden days when I was a beginning PhD student and I gave him my first dramatic sketch and he almost uh, fell over backwards because the English was so bad. <laughs> um, <Good job. laughs> somehow he has not given up on me and I hope my English has improved a little uh, since then. Um, so we go back a long time from since, you know, I... I uh, started out uh, as a beginning Africanist. Uh, Tucker comes from Portland State University of Portland. He is one of the most indefatigable field linguists I know of. Um, <laughs> I said I'm pretty fatigued. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't look it. Um, so he has worked um, on a number of Atlantic languages, uh, for all of which he has produced first descriptions. He is also a leading scholar in the domain of idiophone research and has pioneered a new approach um, in the 90s, which is now, you know, this papers on this issue on our classics, I believe. And he started recently um, to establish yet another field site, working on a new language in a multilingual context. Um, and uh, so I'm very happy to have him here today um, to tell us about new techniques for measuring multilingualism. And I'll Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, it, it's always so invigorating to come here, uh, just to, to see uh, colleagues and, and people I've seen, you know, here and there over the years. Oh, hi. <laughs> Speaking of one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I just had a... Anyway, we, we can talk later. Um, anyway, uh, it's just great to be here because it's so invigorating uh, and such a stimulating place. Uh, you know, I sit back in my little hole in, in Portland, Oregon, and, and uh, uh, no one... I can't talk with anyone about African linguistics or about contact phenomena, multilingualism, idiophones, uh, pigeons and creoles. Uh, there's just no one there, so it's just... This is like a total holiday for me. Anyway, thank you very much for being here today. And um, I hope everything will work. We, uh, thanks for setting that up. I think it, the links are all good now. Anyway, uh, and Jeff, thank you for bringing me here. So these, the, these two projects that, you, that are interacting today are tremendously exciting. And, you know, I feel kind of... Um, Funny, even talking about my own work when there are these massive projects with cast of millions, cost or cast of thousands, cost of millions. Uh, you know, my little documentation project is so tiny. But anyway, that's that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, right. So, pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about has already been talked about today. And I, I'm sorry for those who have been uh, in my company because I'm, I'm going to repeat a lot of the stuff that you, uh, that you talk about. But um, I think it'll be all right. Okay, so uh, let's see. I have to get clear which... Okay, so uh, multilingualism has now been recognized as the norm rather than as the exception, and uh, I don't think that's anybody that uh, that's anything that comes as much of a surprise to the people here. Uh, but it's certainly uh, something that needs to be described and, and theorized. Um, the, the the projects that are ongoing here are certainly um, wonderful in that regard. Uh, So instead of worrying about the ideal speaker here, we're going to uh, talk about 
the actual speaker here, one that's, one that's uh, typically multilingual. So um, I've been involved with African multilingualism since 1970 when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And I was at a, what at the time I thought was a tremendously exciting place. It was at the intersection of the three borders of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And in those, at that intersection, you had, uh, Kisi was, the, it was a Kisi area, but no one spoke Kisi in the, in the towns. They spoke Mandinka, Malenke, uh, uh, or uh, Fula, there were a lot of Fulas there. They, were the, they controlled the cattle and the, the transportation. Uh, there were even some uh, Lebanese merchants, uh, so you heard some Arabic, people from Mauritania, from Cote d'Ivoire, uh, and there were three major market towns, one in Liberia, one in uh, Sierra Leone, Quendu, and then uh, Bekadu, which was over the border in uh, Guinea. In all three of these places, you had just terrific markets, really, really exciting markets, and the, the swirl of languages there was, was tremendously exciting, uh, especially to, to me, a little, uh, little white kid from you know, a small Midwestern town. My town was so small, you saw the population change from 350 to 400. <laughs> That's a total, <laughs> not thousands. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that was my first exposure to it. So, but all, all, the peop- all the towns were in the Kisi-speaking area, and the Kisi had been there, uh, but the, the Kisi had been dominated for, uh, well, at least the trade in the Kisi area had been dominated for centuries by... Uh, you know, the Mandi expansion, which, which began in the first millennium and uh, gradually uh, grew to be what it was at the time I was there. Uh, other prominent languages were, of course, the pigeons that had arisen in, in uh, reaction to or maybe uh, in defense from the colonizers. And my, my thesis, in fact, my dissertation was on uh, the substratal influence on the, the three extant pigeons in the area. So you had a sort of French, which I call Guinea French, um, Creole in Sierra Leone, and then Liberian English. And uh, what I proposed to do was to, was to uh, see how the substrate would influence the structures of these three, um, uh, three pigeons. And that was sort of a noble project at the time. Uh, people had just shifted their attention to uh, the substrate, the African substrate in pigeon and creole studies. So it was an exciting topic. And um, there were two other people that were sort of doing the same thing, uh, people who knew about African languages uh, at, at the same time. And so we had a, a nice little uh, conversation going about it. But when I got there, I found out, uh, when I got there to do my research, this is after Peace Corps, I found out that I didn't know enough about Kisi to really do the work. I, I, um, I could speak it, but, but, but the only things I could do was, were uh, you know, buy food in the market and talk to some girl or, or you know, order a beer. Um, but you know, to do the sort of normal everyday stuff that you really need to know how to do uh, was impossible for me. And of course, I was now a little bit of a linguist, and I knew that I knew nothing about the structure of the language, absolutely nothing. So I ended up doing my thesis on the, the, um, the phonology and... and uh, the morphophonology of the language of the <laughs> noun class system. It had just changed from a prefixing to a suffixing language, so there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Okay, all three of these countries had been dominated by a colonial powers. Uh, France and England directly had dominated Sierra Leone and, and Guinea, and Liberia had been uh, uh, dominated to some extent by, by the Americans. Um, uh, firestone rubber, these big concessions, firestone rubber, uh, the extractive ind- industries like iron ore and um, uh, timber companies. And they, uh, of course, had a great influence on the economy, uh, economies of the country. And, and in fact, uh, did, were much responsible for the, the pigeons that arose. Okay, because I didn't know anything about what I was doing, um, I think this illustrates well the sort of uh, uh, hubris that, that a lot of researchers have when they go to Africa and, and get involved in a multilingual situation. You really don't know what you're doing. And I'm, I'm sure 
yeah, uh, <laughs> your laughter <laughs> sort of uh, supports me, uh, that you have to be there on the ground, and you know a lot less than you really think you know once you get there. And uh, hopefully what I'm going to talk about today will help in other people in avoiding some of the same errors that I uh, committed when I was uh, going. It's not only competence in, in you know, doing the analysis and the field work, but it's also um, uh, the whole process of setting up a, a research project, you know, finding your indispensable uh, collaborators and um, sort of being aware of how things can go wrong. Uh, we were just talking about it up, uh, over there. Uh, you can expect everything to go wrong, and uh, so just be prepared. Um, so what, uh, the reason I'm telling you all this is to, to illustrate how difficult it is to uh, characterize a multilingual situation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an elusive beast. Uh, you don't know, uh, well, you don't really know what you're doing until you get there, and it's unlikely that you're going to know enough to do the work that really needs to be done. And so you devise shortcuts, you divide... Uh, different mechanisms for getting at what you what you what you want to describe, and that's what I'm going to uh, um, talk about today. <coughs> okay, so here's a brief overview of the talk. Okay, my focus is not on the pristine and, and disappearing uh, situations of rural small scale multilingualism as uh, uh, Federica was talking about this morning, but rather on the uh, more common situation in places I've worked. I've, I've done uh, field work in East Africa and in Southern Africa, uh, but my major work has been in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And, uh, and I've seen many different kinds of multilingual situations. And you know, or at least I know on the basis of that experience, uh, that there can be many different types of multilingualism. Uh, the, you know, there, there can be situations where you have an urban variety arising. There can be pigeons. Uh, there can be uh, you know, this sort of flat, uh, monoglossic multilingualism. That's a new word we invented today. Uh, it, uh, more, more seriously, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, multilingualism well, in South Africa, I saw how the manipulation of language and the, the sort of uh, propagation or the enforcement of multilingualism uh, by the apartheid government uh, furthered the, the government's objectives. So it was a political tool as well. So you see all these different functions of multilingualism, and, and that points to another difficulty, not only the technical difficulty of analyzing a linguistic object, but also of seeing it in the proper sociocultural context. That is, that's just as, as much a challenge as, as anything else. Okay, this study forms part of a larger study aimed at representing multilingualism in collaboration with several colleagues at my home university in the departments of geography and urban studies, namely mapping multilingualism in Portland. While some of you might say, well, Portland's all white people, and uh, to a certain extent that's true, but it's, it's changing rapidly, and uh, I think it will be easier to handle than anything that exists in Africa. But nonetheless, they have a... Uh, one of the best urban studies departments in the country, and uh, the, the geographers there are quite good too. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting more involved. I won't talk about that much today, um, but um, that's the context in which you should see uh, what I'm talking about. Okay, so the, the challenges to an empirical characterization of, of the situation is, is formidable. Uh, just capturing the data is difficult enough the analysis may prove even uh, greater challenges. Uh, measuring multilingualism, except in a very crude way, may be impossible, though I will suggest at the end of the paper some recent innovations that may facilitate the progress, the process, and uh, we've certainly seen uh, some today. Uh, I have a rather lengthy review of the literature that I'm, I don't think I'm going to go through too much, but I do want to say something about the framework Uh, so, um, this all this comes from uh, uh, Vivian Cook, and uh, opposes a monolingual 
perspective to a bilingual perspective, what he calls multi-competence. And I'm glad I found out he was a male before I came here and could use that pronoun because I wasn't <laughs> sure uh, before I came here. Uh, but uh, this is a, a perspective, uh, the, the bilingual perspective, <laughs> and it should be multilingual perspective, is one that I think is, is familiar to most everybody. So I won't spend uh, too much time talking about that. But uh, the, the one thing that uh, the papers in this edited volume, it's another one of these great big handbooks, you know, that cost a million dollars and none of us can ever buy, uh, that uh, talks about the, the multi, uh, talks about multi-competence. And uh, they're mostly interested, in, unfortunately, in SLA, second language acquisition. And so you hear about how the learning a second language influences L1. Uh, to we, me, that's not a terribly important issue. Uh, but that's the, the, what the papers are mostly about. Nonetheless, the perspective is a good one, and I think one that's, that's uh, worthwhile for our purposes. Uh, one point that they make in one of these papers is talking about the variation that can exist in the relationship between languages. And there were some nice, um, well, I guess only the middle one's a, a real Venn diagram, uh, but below separation, you had two circles, language A, language B, separate. And under interconnection, you had uh, overlapping uh, circles with you know, a shared area, like a Venn diagram. And then uh, the third one is integration, where they're coincident. You know, the, the, the two languages are, are, are the same. So um, th this, they're, they're just many different ways languages can... can um, uh, uh, relate to each other. And that's true not just of the languages themselves, but also for the different parts of the grammar. And uh, so as this just points, to one of the, points out to one of the um, uh, uh, difficulties in, in characterizing multilingualism. Another place I looked for encouragement or, or uh, approaches to uh, characterizing multilingualism were these uh, two sanctioning institutions, uh, this, uh, the European one, uh, CEFR, uh, and then ACTFL in the United States. And the, I'm going to talk about ACTFL because um, I was actually uh, involved in developing the, the guidelines for um, <coughs> measuring how well one spoke an African language. And uh, it was kind of a a fun experience uh, because the, the people from Ackfield knew nothing about African languages, uh, nothing whatsoever. But you had some of the world's leading experts, American experts on African languages. So Will Laban was there, David Dwyer was there, Russ Shu, and so on. Uh, and it, so for me as a graduate student, it was a really heady time uh, hanging out with these uh, people who, who knew so much. Anyway, so uh, one of the things we decided in uh, one of the many, many workshops we had was that uh, learning how to use earphones was considered to be one of these top, top abilities. So if you look at this, I call it a spike. I don't know. <coughs> what do you call this shape? Anybody got an idea? Hey, so you look down at the bottom, and presumably you know, there are very few language skills that you have when you're a low novice, what, whatever that is, that means saying bonjour, maybe, uh, nothing else. And then uh, going up, you acquire more and more competencies uh, in the languages until you reach distinguished. Uh, we put idiophones in the category of advanced high. So that's the, the second the, or the third to the top. S distinguished is probably like a native speaker. Superior is pretty close. You maybe speak with an accent and you... Uh, can, but you can talk about uh, pretty much anything. What these, these organizations are good for is, it, is uh, sort of calibrating uh, these levels and sort of uh, differentiating between speakers. Just to let you know what, what one thing I didn't like about the whole process was that to, to test your, your ability in different languages, and I spoke several different languages at the time, so I was tested in a bunch of different languages. What they do is they... they push you as far as they could until you broke down. So, you know, just, you just felt like crying at the end of one of these sessions. You know, it was, it was horrible. Um, they, you know, they, they, they'd ask you questions, and 
uh, talk, you know, try to get you to use the subjunctive in French and, and uh, you know, to all these sort of crazy things. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they, they at least have ways of evaluating um, uh, uh, proficiencies. Uh, notice, however, that this is still the monolingual approach where you're, you're, trying, you're testing someone in their ability to speak a language like a native speaker. You're not looking at the, the person's language ability. Uh, the next one, the next place I was looking around was at uh, various missionary uh, techniques, primarily uh, SIL, but there are a bunch of other ones. I, is that me? Oh, okay. Um, a lot more romantic. Uh, the the um, <coughs> the I've I've worked. Uh, oh. oh, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> it's like butt dialing somebody. Uh, so, um, I've worked with with missionaries for many many years in the field in West Africa, and uh, in Southern Africa as well. Uh, there are pe people working on click languages down there. And, um, you know, I have mixed feelings about them, as, as everyone does. Uh, but they've been, they've been uh, very helpful, and they've been uh, pioneers in developing uh, field techniques uh, uh, and um, programs that I've used. For example, I use Flex still, and I, I like Flex a lot. Um, uh, it, it, it's good for developing a grammar and building a lexicon and, and those kinds of things. Um, but of course, we always put it in Elon and we bring it over here. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I looked at some of their, their techniques and I, I didn't find any of them really very happy. Um, they, they were useful, but you have to remember what their, their purpose is. What they're trying to do is to figure out if they need to uh, provide translations of a Bible for a certain group. So they have to figure out What's the most important dialect? Or how many different <coughs> Bibles do we need? How many different teams do we have to send in? So that's very different from I, I, what I think we're doing. And um, there's also a tendency for them to, to split rather than lump. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, because they gives them sort of job security. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they will always have Bibles to translate if they keep... Yeah. You know, translating them into different into different um, uh, languages, what they call languages, and I found that particularly true in my little group of languages, the Mel languages. Not they're not Atlantic anymore; they're Mel, uh, and they 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 it it's really, I'd say, two major languages with a lot of dialects that have diverged quite a bit, and they've divided them up into all different languages. Uh, so, um, as I say, with my little group, I think they've, they've overdone it. Okay, so I wasn't terribly happy with um, their techniques. And I also looked at the literature and social psychology, you know, domain analysis, code switching. Uh, I wasn't in language attitude studies, all oh, different kinds of stuff. I won't talk about that. I think anymore. So, uh, in the next slide, I have some of the the questions that were that I that I'm, that I'm thinking about. Uh, so, actually, what is it? And you know, talking about your typology is is you know uh, one way to get there. I think uh, is Africa special? This is a question that I'm that I'm often asked, and I think yes, Africa is special. Uh, and you can ask me why in the questions if you want. Um, oh, here I go again. <laughs> uh, is it different from multilingualism in other parts of the world? Uh, what are the governing ideologies to Africa? Uh, and then what are the social factors? What is the role of social factors in determining the extent to which an individual is multilingual, particularly uh, with regard to gender and age? This is one place I think that uh, research uh, can, can do some. Uh, real good. Uh, local identity, uh, ethnicity, language and nationalism, uh, and then the orientation towards the city or country. 
uh, yeah, and, and so on. I've talked about that. Okay, with, with these questions in mind, uh, what I thought I'd do is see if I could understand better what uh, multilingualism meant in this uh, small town where I was working. Thank you, ELDP, so, <laughs> supporting this work. Uh, <coughs> can you see this map okay? Is that too small? Should I blow it up? It's okay? It's okay? Yeah. okay, good. All right, so if you look at this map, uh, you see the yellow and, and green, and then there's crew down here. Uh, it looks like the Atlantic languages are really important and vibrant and stuff like that. But if you take away Wolof, uh, Timni, Fula, uh, and probably Serer, uh, you're left with a lot of little languages spoken all down here. Uh, and yeah, if you look at Federica's area, you know, there are a lot of little languages all over the place. And uh, that's particularly true down in this neck of the woods where I operate. Um, so this is Liberia. I don't know where are we? Yeah, this is Sierra Leone. I work around here and on the border. Anyway, so let's look at the next map. So this is a map of uh, a so-called Bulum. Bulum is one of the groups that I think is only one language, but they're divided up into uh, uh, three. I did work on uh, what they call Krim, and that's so crazy because the language has no phonemic R. <laughs> and Bohm, <laughs> Bohm is the other language right here, and then they show uh, Sherbro being spoken all along here, which is also ridiculous. And then they, here's another one, they call it Mani here, but no one calls it Mani. They, they, Mani, they call it Mani. Um, they do have M's in the language, uh, and uh, this is this is a dialect of Bulum that got separated by the Timni uh, at enough time depth so that the language really is a different language now. I think, but it really is Bulum. There's one language, Bulum, which differentiated into Bohm and and, and Kim um, a long time ago. But the missionaries are still at it. You know, I, I just talked to a woman. I said, well, did you read any of my stuff? And Because I said, you know, it's really one language. She said, yeah, but I, I don't really think you're right. I said, have you been there and done any work? No. So anyway, they're going to go on. So this is where the, the research site is located. This, uh, this, they call it a peninsula, but I don't know if it's really a peninsula. Where Schenge is the town that I'm located in. And this is a, a, a terrific fishing area that's unfortunately being fished out. The, the, you know, these big trawler um, ships are offshore and they're just scraping the bottom and taking away all the fish. Anyway, this is, this is where we are. Okay, so in, if the world were a, uh, a perfect place, this is what uh, you'd want a multilingualism metric to look like. You'd want everybody in the community to, to be actively participating in the project, helping you design things, helping you uh, 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 achieve outcomes and, and, and uh, do something uh, that everyone wanted. It would also be easy and quick to administer. Um, you're not supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> um, you want results, of course, that are reliable and valid. And uh, I'd, I would like to have extrapolation possible um, uh, on the basis of a reliable or representative sample, uh, sociolinguistically sensitive and informed, uh, takes into consideration reigning attitudes and ideologies, and no literacy required. I work with people who don't know how to read and write, generally speaking. Uh, and it should be conducted in the volunteer's language of choice, the volunteer, the person that you're getting the linguistic data from. Um, and fun and non-intimidating. There should be no test. It should be easy to analyze. Results should be comparable across languages. And of course, 
that's the way it ended up, just perfect in every way. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's inevitably... Uh, uh, a, a sequence of compromises as you, you know, you get towards a, a, uh, a particular goal. Okay, so people say, well, geez, why do you, why are you looking at idiophones uh, if you uh, want to find out about multilingualism? Well, you've already had one reason, um, and that comes from the, you know, the, the, the actual proficiency guidelines. When idiophones are considered advanced level of, of, of proficiency. And so if you uh, control idiophones, it's assumed that you, are, are, you know the language. And you also know about um, sociocultural stuff. It's not just functional, instrumental kind of stuff, but really a little bit beyond that because idiophones <coughs> are so um, uh, socially implicated. A uh, second reason was uh, that they're found in all the languages in, in the area, uh, the three major languages that I was dealing in this study are Sherbro. This is the target language of the doc documentation. Like Mendy, the language everybody's uh, switching to, and Creole, which is the resident pigeon Creole in uh, Sierra Leone. Another big advantage to idiophones is that they're perceptually salient. You'll, you'll hear in just a sec. Uh, and also, uh, I devised a way. This is my field methods instrument. This is all I had to do. I just carried it in my pocket all the time. And anytime I came across someone who was appropriate, I'd say, hey, you want to help me out? And, and people usually would. It would take 10 minutes to collect the data. <coughs> OK, uh, let me talk for, about the stimuli now. Um, in this table, I, I don't think you can read this. I couldn't blow up the, the font, but there was a, um, oh, and look at the numbers, screwed up too. Anyway, the, the, um, these are all idiophones in a thesis done at uh, Fort Bay College in, in uh, Freetown. What she did was she listed the first column, idiophone, then the so-called popular context, like the definition, but really idiophones are hard to define. Uh, next thing was uh, in a Mende sentence, and then uh, the translation. Okay, so from this list of, uh, what was the total, 300 and something idiophones? Something like that. Uh, no, 286. I, was, I recorded 66 and then um, uh, selected uh, 20 out of those uh, for the study. And just to illustrate to you what the person I recorded uh, producing the idiophones was uh, Momo Tazif Karoma, who was a professor of, well, a lecturer in linguistics at uh, Fort Bay College. He had supervised this thesis and also was Mr. Mende. He knew everything about Mende there was ever to know. I, I brought him along as, a, as a, uh, a fellow lecturer to one, you know, the in, what's it called? In, the, it's like Summer Institute of, of Documenting Endangered Languages in the State, Infield. Oh, Colang, yeah, Colang is its name now. Yeah, so um, I brought him along, and uh, he served. He and I taught a course. On, oh, you were in that class, weren't you, Jeff? Yeah. He and I taught a course on uh, ethics, which was kind of interesting. Um, and he also served as an informant. The problem was he didn't really know how to be an informant. So he'd always tell the answers to the students. And I said, no, you just have to be, you know, uh, uh, a non-linguist and not to this, but he, he did it uh, the whole time and, and uh, sort of ruined the course. Uh, but anyway, here's, here's, here's him talking to me, explaining how to, what an idiot phone mean. Round object. I don't know what I use the gun. Look at that, look at that. Look at that, 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 he also stutters that's a little Go around quickly, round, yeah, go around quickly and complete. Go around quickly and completely. Mm. Silly sentence again? Mm. Silly sentence. Leave Penna You are Come quickly. Go Penna Calafio. Ah. 
Afandi. Okay, so Afandi is cotton. Is a is a is a, is a trend on that to, to, to make clothes. Okay, well, you get a you can get a, a feel for what it was like. So from that from our discussion of each one of the idiophones, and I use that discussion to inform my um, uh, scoring of the individual idiophones. Um, uh, I I cut out. Uh, well, I cut out a couple of uh, productions of the idiophone by itself, and then idiophones and sentences. He usually produced his own sentences. He didn't like the ones that uh, the student had come up with. And then I put those in uh, a bunch of files. Oh, yeah. So how did I choose the idiophones to use? Well, I wanted to get a range of iconicity. Uh, so I, I, choose, I chose some ones that were onomatopoeic, all the way up to, you know, uh, size, sound symbolism ones, ones that weren't quite so um, clearly uh, iconic. Uh, so, in, and in between those were something like the ringing of a bell, there's water falling, and then the movement of air. Uh, I tried to mix up the formal features as much as possible. Uh, narrowness versus breadth of meaning. Some idiophones uh, can mean only one thing. They use it only, they have uh, severe uh, selectional restrictions. Uh, and uh, a, a very uh, specific and narrow uh, you know, context of use across the senses. I never, I, I didn't find any smell ones though. Smell idiophones aren't that common. Uh, yeah, so all the different domains. And I, I tried to pick ones that I thought were uh, familiar. All right, so they were, each, each subject was, uh, could listen to three practice idiophones. And then you had the idiophone produced in isolation from a written list, and then uh, it was pronounced uh, twice by itself. Then it was used in one or more sentences, usually uh, two. Here, let me give you an example. So this is an idiophone, meaning a uh, state of being thin and small. And I don't think this is the sentence he produces, but it'd be used like talking about the monkey's arms. You see what I mean about perceptually salient, right? <laughs> it's pretty obvious which word is the idiophone. And here's one that I bet everyone can guess. You weren't supposed to peek. He loved producing some of these. Um, all right, so... Here's one that, oh, so everybody got this one right. You know, there was a, the sound of a sheep. And this is the, probably the most clearly iconic one. It's a track man out of here. On this one, practically no one got it. And, but this one, people did get. Do, <laughs> He's kind of a ham too. So, anyway, that, um, anyway, you, you got a feel for what the, the stimuli were like. They were given twenty of these, and they were asked to to explain what the idiophone meant. And um, so far, they've been they've been uh, evaluated on a scale of one to three. I think I might change that, but anyway. For right now, for that's what I evaluate them on. Okay, so here's who the subjects were. Uh, I tried to get a mix of Sherbro and Mende speakers, so some who were all Sherbro, no Mende, Sherbro and some Mende, Mende and no Sherbro, and then Mende and some Sherbro. And everyone spoke Creole and, and uh, some spoke English. Not uh, really, nobody spoke English. Um, the subjects were all pretty well educated, they'd gone through maybe 12 years of. Of, of education. Uh, there were nine females and six males. Uh, here are the instructions. We don't have to look at those, I don't think. Um, okay, let me, let me move on to the findings now. Well, yeah, so what they had to do was they had to explain. And they could use whatever language they wanted in their response. And I had, I, I, I did the interviews and I did a few in, in Creole, but it was mostly assistants who did it in either Mende or 
or uh, Sherbo or, or Creole. Okay, so as one might expect, the, the judge forms something of a bipolar distribution, subject to either identifying them uh, correctly or, uh, or not. And uh, the, what, I was, what I was, well, I was hoping for a lot of things, but um, the, I wanted to see what speakers of Bullum, who also knew Mende, if they would uh, identify idiophones. Uh, they were a- they, they were able to uh, identify idiophones, and uh, surprisingly, the old people were, but the young people were not. Not 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 quite so surprisingly, but um, it was uh, really quite dramatic. Uh, one problem was that I couldn't find many people, uh, any many speakers of Mende who also spoke Bullum. They would, they 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 typically wouldn't learn. Uh, Bullum. And the one person who did, I, d- I don't think really knew it very much. So young people knew them not as well as adults. Um, the data still are really insufficient. As I say, this is a, a pilot uh, study. Um, but I think it, I, I can say that uh, idiophone knowledge seems... Oh, sorry. I was doing this to the microphone. Um, uh, Idiophone knowledge did uh, uh, correlate with expected competence in the language on the basis of people's histories and on the paper basi- uh, 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 basis of, of what they said. So that's, that's something good. Uh, there are a few things about idiophones. Ah, we don't have to worry about this either. You want to see it? Uh, so I already said about the... The, the, the goat or sheep was 100% <laughs> of the time. Falling objects. This one surprised me. Bing was identified as something falling. It, I forget what it was. It was a, I don't think it was in the water. Um, the heavy rain, people got a lot of that. And then for the birds in flight, fio fio, but not the fasaka fasaka one. Usually labial dentals and, and uh, labials uh, have to do with moving rapidly or air movement or something like that. Uh, so, eventually, what I'd like to do is to use idiophones from the two other languages in, a multilingual, in the multilingual area, uh, Creole and, and Sherbro, and uh, see um, how, that, how, how that will work out with you know, a much more varied sample than I uh, had here. And, of course, I'd, I'd like to uh, do a lot more in terms of language surveys and ethnographies to find out uh, what the multilingual situation is on the basis of uh, of that information. The real the real future, I I think. But you know, uh, I, I'm sure some of you've heard of uh, Mark Dingerman. Say he has, uh, with regard to idiophones, uh, done a lot of videotaping without him being there. You know, he'll just leave the machine on and and take pictures of people. Um, 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 talking, you know, I, I think they're cracking palm nuts or making palm oil or something like that, just so they were seated and they were right there, and he had, could have the camera steady on them the whole day. And you know, he got like um, three earphones over two days or something like that. It wasn't a real productive thing, but but uh, completely naturalistic. <laughs> that that to me is a is a desideratum, uh, and because there, there's 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 so much storage capacity now, uh, 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 we can do it. I mean. Uh, Jeff and Friedrich have talked about this in, in relation to their project. Uh, and I've, I've sort of done this in a preliminary way, talking about uh, using ASR to, to identify uh, languages in, over an extended discourse. I was just blown away by how much you, stuff you have transcribed. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I know you've got a big team, but still, it's a lot of, lot of transcription. Uh, with with um, Automatic speech recognition, you can uh, at least identify the languages very reliably, uh, very quickly. And that's, that's something that would be uh, useful in this sort of work. So I think that's a, another place the uh, research should go. So I guess this is pretty close to the conclusion. I'm not going to go over how, how, all the mistakes I made. 
but there are a lot. Um, so uh, what methodology is best? Well, it ha uh, this is kind of dull stuff. A combination of, of different uh, approaches. Um, I think you know, keeping the idea of multilingual or multi-competence models of, uh, in mind, get native speakers involved, and um, think about the, the social linguistic and social cultural uh, context. Um, so this is basically a, a paper about methodology. And what I wanted to do is to, to find or, uh, yeah, what I wanted to do was to find some instrument that would get uh, or provide me with insights as to um, the, the the competence of uh, multilinguals in the various languages in uh, the the Shenge area, and I th I think this is going to work. I mean, it's it's got some uh, kinks to iron out, but I, I think it's 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 going to be useful. Uh, so. A method for everyone to try. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I am trying to find your underlying hypothesis regarding this. And um, so this is a question. So um, not having found, the, you know, that K in the talk, I was kind of trying to construe one myself. And I thought, okay, if I'm in a multilingual environment like this, so one, of course, knowing that multilinguals are not several stacked on monolinguals, what would that, what information would that give me on the type of multilingual practice? And I thought, okay. It has often been claimed that, you know, multilinguals in Africa, for instance, in Africa, nobody has a mother tongue. Right? They have no native language, the concept is superfluous. Or people have more than one native language. So they have more than one native like competence. And of course both can be true or false, depending on the context. So some people may really have no native language, so they speak no language with this fully fledged repertoire that we associate with the native language. Because they have been so mobile, they, you know, they have grown up in, in such a diverse context where now attention has been paid to socializing them in, to this kind of deep like monolingual setting. Or some people might have several kind of monolingual style, you know, kind of prototypical monolingual competencies. Um, so is that something uh, that, that motivates? Yeah. Yeah, I think what, I, what, I wanted, what I'd like to do is to find out Okay, let's let's go on the assumption that you've got everybody maximally competent in all three of the the languages, mm -hmm. and then um, is that true or not? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, why is that? Why is it not true? Mm -hmm. And then look at the the social factors that go along with these different competencies, mm -hmm. and you can you can do it with life histories, you can do it mm -hmm. with with um, you know social factors. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I think get a very, pretty good picture about what the, the multilingual situation is. That, that's that's my meant to describe the data. So it's it's a kind of triage task to find out to, to, to identify different <laughs> types of speakers and then dig deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we're done. Um. So um, as a psycholinguist. Um, of course, I'm about method and what you're actually testing here. Right? Yeah. So um, if you give, so if you give speakers a prompt and then you ask them what do you think this means, this had not mu has not much to do with their proficiency, competency, but it has something to do what they can derive out of the sound, right? Yeah. And what they think <coughs> it is. So it's. Basically, it's a meta judgment, and it's not much related to um, the competency. And we know also there's an asymmetry that you have. You can understand loads before you start speaking. So there's an asymmetry between perception, between comprehension and production. So we have an asymmetry there, 
Um, so first of all, if you ask them, what do you think this means? This doesn't has nothing to do with what they understand or what, how they can produce it. So their language competency is not tested. Well, yeah, no, competency is a word that's used <laughs> really um, kind of strangely in this literature. And I just picked it up. But, right, you know, right. Not, but what I'm saying is that it has not much to do with, you know, what they can produce and what they would actually do in mm -hmm. a different situation where they might be using it. So that's one of the methodological issues about this setup of playing an isolated sentence with something and asking them for an interpretation. Mm -hmm. Because you can ask me what ba means, and I don't know yeah. Menda, Sherbo, or any of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I can come up because of the sound symbolism. Yeah. So you're tapping into a different source here and into a different kind of interpretation process that's on a meta level. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the issues. The other one is the assumption that so I'm wondering, and I don't know the literature on idiophones in the psycholinguistic literature so well, but um, Noriko has done work on this, is mm -hmm. about um, when are idiophones acquired? So is it really something that is on a very high level, or is it something that comes in? So when you learn it, when you learn languages, right, you learn things in different speeds. You learn certain things are easy, certain things come, you know? So one of the question is, is there any evidence that the use of video phones is a very high level skill set? Because from Japanese, from her work, it's intermediate. Mm -hmm. And the highly proficient stop using them, actually. So they might avoid them, right? Yeah, I, 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 oh. So one of the, the other question is the basic assumption that is underlined that this is a high proficiency item, namely using Idiophone in a production, which is different from guessing what it could mean. Yeah, I mean, versus using it yeah. in a comprehension test. So what I'm saying is that the methodology, I think, is not tapping into multilingual competency in the way that from the work that you're doing on on the ground or that Jeff is doing or that Frederica is doing. So if Choosing a different method in terms of testing competency or testing it will give you better results than this because it's tapping into a metalinguistic interpretation. Mm -hmm. That might be interesting and it reveals attitudes and ideologies and ideas about uh, idiophones and something about how easy iconicity is to map certain kind of things and how difficult it is. We would need to, for example, compare the idiophone you chose with the lexical item in the strongest language to see if there's any mapping of a B sound with whatever the sound was to see if they have something to rely on that comes from their own language um, to be able to get a clean set of stimuli um, to then test that. But others, other measures would be helping you more to tap into actual competency in terms of recognition, so comprehension, and in terms of production that would go rather into um, that reaction or that cognitive domain. Because the first slide that you showed are the slides <coughs> of, are these two separate ones, do they have overlaps or is it one system? The psycholinguistic literature is all about this idea there's language and language and language in the brain or there's language and language that overlaps a little bit or now we think it's one system that goes into different ways. And I think that's the really interesting thing to test for example, for video phones, but we need to establish the acquisition history first to have an understanding of what we're actually testing. So, from a from a methodological yeah. point of view, I, I yeah, think no, I, do, I, I understand your objections. Um, the um, first of all, remember that there are, there are the different levels of iconicity. You know, the ones I played for you um, were you know, at the higher end of yeah. non-arbitrary association, yeah. just yeah. To, you yeah. know, to get a feel for it. Uh, and um, I, I mean, I, another sort of issue that I'm interested in is, is whether uh, in a, a, a multilingual area will uh, idiophones be transferred or be shared across, uh, you know, linguistic boundaries or is there just one sort of confidence with regard to idiophones? Uh, and um, th th this is you know, way too little data to answer uh, that question. So I think that's that's an interesting question to ask or to think about. Um, 
and let me see there's something else I want to say. What was the uh, oh yeah. Uh, of course this I mean this is one one possible way of getting at uh, idiophone knowledge without you know having people produce them or having to do having to do something uh, like Mark has done, you know, with, with leaving a uh, a recorder on all day and, and doing it with a bunch of different people. Uh, I was able to uh, you know, send people out and it seemed to work pretty well and uh, uh, people were uh, not reluctant uh, to, to, to be recorded. Uh, in other situations, uh, people have been reluctant to be recorded. Yeah. And uh, so you know, see, everything's a compromise. You know? Well, it's you yeah. want to you want to combine methods. Yeah, no, right? that's, that's so my last is, point. You would you would want to have you know a similar set <coughs> with things where you know they would be producing to have to have naturalistic produced um, idiophones with a similar set of you know whatever the, the work they've done like um, Birgit and Freddie have done on positionals and cost motion and cost a placement events for example where you can elicit them and get them. That gives you an idea about what they use. Yeah, you want to back that up with naturalistic data, and then you can take that to use in a testing situation, and that you correlate with the language proficiency that you have assessed whether someone speaks a little bit of this or a lot of this. Because again, it's again this issue of competency. You know, someone might be competent in talking on the market; the other one might be competent in telling you full sure. stories yeah. where they're using a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So it's again. So we need to have a dynamic notion of this competency thing, and the ones that are used to telling lots of stories, for example, I would assume they know those better than the ones that are doing only trade, because that's the vocabulary they have, for example. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's just a... I'm when, when, I, when I was sort of interacting with Kita, uh, and uh, he was doing the Sylvester and Tweety Bird you know, stuff... I told you all about those um, guys. I, I did something like that with a bunch of Zulu speakers, and um, you know. Not Sylvester and Tweety. What was it? No, just don't use Sylvester and Tweety. Is what I'm saying. Oh, well, anyway, <laughs> that, 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 was that is the, normal in the given situation. <laughs> well, anyway, just uh, we're using uh, Sylvester and Tweety with the Japanese people and the English. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, not everybody will know this, but it's a cartoon. <laughs> And it's an action-packed cartoons with bowling balls going down gutters and stuff like that. And a lot of stuff that you expect would be characterized by idiophones. And um, so I, I devised a lab experiment that I won't go into the details of. But um, what I was looking at was the synchrony of idiophones with gesture. And um, that part turned out pretty well. But uh, it, because the experiment was so poorly designed, uh, and it was so labor intensive, um, I didn't uh, carry it much further. Uh, I mean, maybe today you could do something like that, maybe not so much in Tweety, but. but, uh, with, with, no, but the, the, a lot of the stimulus material that was developed, for example, for positionals and whatnot, was, you know, a bottle standing like this and like that and like that, knowing that bottles are recognized, trees mm -hmm. are recognized. I mean, like making. Yeah. You know, adapting, adapting it to yeah. the cultural thing, not yeah. adapting to the Celeste and Tweety, not at all. That's just insane. Yeah, but, 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 and uh, but what I find interesting, so I was an uh, uh, official uh, OPI tester, active uh, tester before. So these participants are also tested for their proficiency level. It was very interesting to find that the, the, the use of merit did not correlate with the level of uh, proficiency. And that's, oh, really? uh, yeah. Uh, so it's, well, it correlates a little bit in, in that uh, beginning level learn, uh, speakers can't possibly use medics. It's very difficult. I mean, they don't know have the knowledge. I think that might, I mean, a high level of proficiency and uh, uh, knowledge of um, medics might correlate. But the production was, it didn't correlate very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in fact, stereo level, stereo level speakers coming from Korea, who, who also has lots of medics, yeah. did not use any medics whatsoever for rolling events, for example. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 Sylvester rolling down, where you know Kita has uh, you know 
uh, discussed quite a bit because uh, you can tell us it has tend to use a lot of korogoro, korokoro yeah. and such. But it was that so internet level speakers started to use, some of them started to use it, use that use mimetics and the advanced level speakers used quite a bit of them. But I thought maybe it has something to do with also the uh, the social or the register factors of mimetics. Yeah. Mimetics is associated with colloquial language. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. it has to do something with uh, playfulness as well. So Mark, obviously, you know, <coughs> video recorded uh, conversation with internet and friends and so forth, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, you know, daily life setting. Mm -hmm. But as soon as speakers are, you know, given in this setting where they have to describe, uh, narrate the events, um, for research purposes, and uh, the, some of the non-native speakers, I think, actually, native speakers are quite, some of them are quite animated and use a lot of medics, but non-native speakers still have this sense of being tested for their proficiency, even though mm -hmm. they were talking to age peers, they were talking, so I uh, early on found that uh, if I asked native speakers of Japanese to this, uh, narrate these uh, suggest and treat it to me, they use, uh, you know, they don't use mimetics. But once they start talking to Asia, another kind of student, they started using a lot of them, you know, the animated description of, um, of the scenes. Mm -hmm. But these very high level speakers, square level speakers coming from Korea, they want to be uh, very good. So mimetics are kind of, uh, I mean, your points, maybe an interesting vocabulary uh, in that you cannot pinpoint the you know, the exact <coughs> word that describe the sensation or describe the motion. And even native speakers would have different choices. And uh, book is a book, but then what kind of walking it is yeah. might be interpreted differently depending on native speakers. And non-native speakers would find difficult to, to link the mimetic that they know, they have a knowledge of, to, I mean, they might have come up with different possibilities. And so, uh, advanced level speakers who may not care so much about being perfect might be willing to describe them in a way that they would interpret. But yeah, I, I yeah. think your, your, your basic point is, is, is right on. That, that idiophones, the use of idiophones, is tied to, to, to many social factors, to many cultural factors, and also to some purely linguistic factors. Yeah. And um, you know, teasing that apart uh, is something that you know a lot of people are working on. Matter of fact, there's, there's a conference in Japan, in Tokyo, at, in uh, Christmas on idiophones and medics, and there are a few Africans are going to be there. Uh, I'll be there too. Yeah. Oh, good. We'll see you there. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but to go back to something I didn't uh, answer that my, my Dana asked, and that was you know when idiophones are acquired, and this is a I know of only one study, and it was in South Africa, and uh, she was looking at uh, whether kids controlled idiophones, and uh, they didn't uh, until fairly late in the game. So that goes along with, with what you were saying as well. And I think that's right. Uh, I, you know, some of the more uh, complex social, cultural, linguistic uh, behaviors are acquired later on. So. Uh, so it's a very interesting set of vocabulary for sure, so I'm yeah. really interested yeah. in your work. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yes, I think it's, it's really a fascinating topic that really, you know, uh, requires uh, more research. So, so maybe not to use it as a tool to test competencies, mm -hmm. um, but I'd rather um, look at repertoires. You know, look at look at that as part of a repertoire, and there's a detailed study of repertoire and how it's shaped and what to be run by, and what is language dependent, what is language independent. But go, going back to this question of where it comes in the acquisition and whether it is, you know, um, actually something that is uh, correlated with high proficiency, got me really thinking, and I think it's a very interesting question, particularly in this area, because I know um, the studies on on uh, Manda, Bambara best, and the editors have been really. Uh, studied in more detail, but um, to my knowledge, both Manda languages and Atlantic languages and idiophones as a systematic part of their vocabulary, so they all have it um, to modify um, color words, at least the three basic color terms that they all share. Um, 
they all have it for manner of movement, and they all have it, for instance, uh, to describe different uh, types of forming. And these are the ones that are most interesting from my perspective, uh, because they are not on a much of quick, or at least not directly iconic. So I think the more iconic ones are really not interesting, because you can also not really know to what extent they're actually part of language, you know, or just, um, you know, uh, descriptive sound. So, so if they're, they're really a robust feature of, of languages in this area in a particular set of domains. So that might mean that they're actually, that they might be acquired in a different way than in South Africa, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an empirical question, really, you know, to, to look at them yeah, and see I, what role they play in the repertoires when they are acquired, in which genres and registers they acquire. I also don't really believe that this is a rural urban con contrast. I was trying to remember who made that claim that idiophones get lost in urban context. Do you remember who that was? Was it you? Oh, I was never buying into that claim. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a more nuanced yes, claim. Yes, yeah. um, but I think uh, it's a party. I mean, I think it holds to the extent that a particular interactional context goes away when people move to town. That's it. You know, yeah. That, so a performative uh, context and also often the, associated socially with stigmatized. So storytelling, etc. Um, they're, they're they're stigmatized. Yeah. So what you have is even de idiophonization mm. in urban context. So uh, in, in Zulu, mm -hmm. there's an uh, idiophone, I can't remember what it is, that means something like soft and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, light. And yeah. instead, it, that, that's no longer an idiophone but, in the urban yeah. variety. But do you but think that is related to the standardization process that Zulu undergoes in urban contexts? At least at well, the it's a change in Zulu. Level? It's yeah. a change it's a in Zulu. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's you have a whole range of yeah. Zulus in yeah. like cities. Yeah. Yeah. You have, you know, so Sani Zulu, and then you have sort of nice yeah. Zulu. <laughs> Maybe that's more the yeah. standard one. But so, you know, look at the interaction of context. And, and then collect these genres, and then compare speakers. Yeah. You know, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a complex to topic, yeah. and it's not um, easy to research for uh, a lot of the reasons that mm -hmm. Madonna uh, uh, raised. Uh, nonetheless, I think it, it's it's still you know an <coughs> equivalent we have in our arrow for saying the piece. Good questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is a topic we brought up more towards the end, but um, is it, do you know much, at least in this area, about idiophones and contact? I mean, do you have any sense about whether they're bar I mean, do they exist? Are, how common are the sounds? I mean, are any of these, um, and um, just to make it a little more interesting, partly why I ask is there's one language, I mean, just, I mean, it's interesting anyway, but I, I have a specific data issue, like one language where we are. In Lower Fungo, we know some of the languages have idiophones. I don't know if we know about all of them or not, but there's one that's probably a more recent entrant to the area, and I, it's the one I've worked on most, and I tried hard to elicit one. Plan. I could never yeah. elicit one. I've never seen one in a text. Mm. But there are other ones that clearly aren't so hard. Mm. So, the, uh, you know, um, it, I wouldn't say it's an idiophone, like a really rich, I mean, it's not an area where you're stepping on them all the time, but some languages mm. seem to have a decent set, yes. and at least mm. one I don't, I mean, one time the, the thunder was rumbling, and I'm like, what's that sound? And they're like, thunder. You know, <laughs> thunder stupid. You know, but then, like, come on, come on, you have to have a way of, I mean, yeah. even I can come up with an idea of in English for thunder. You know, like, I mean, I can do something. <laughs> but they wouldn't do it for me, right? Yeah. So, um, and so I'm wondering just to what extent if we have some sort of area, like, how aerial idiophones are, mm -hmm. and what kind of, con is this indicative of a newer entrant to an area if they left them, which we believe for other reasons yeah. is the case? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any sense from this? Yeah, I do. I, I, I've actually written about that. Um, the, the, the short answer is they're usually not transferred across okay. linguistic yes. boundaries. The function can be, and in that mm -hmm. paper I wrote on idiophones and pigeons, mm -hmm. that was the point that I made. Mm -hmm. and, but in certain cases you can, and there, I'm thinking of one particular one, there are so, uh, people in uh, southern Africa called the Tonga who are uh, uh, controlled by their wives, and uh, th these are gross generalizations. <coughs> and uh, when they come into Johannesburg to work, they hang out with the Zulus because the Zulus are considered tough and macho, and, and uh, uh, they control the household. And 
what they do is to, found, find, uh, to sound more Zulu-like when they go back to Tonga Village is, is use Zulu idioms. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So um, that's a, a mm -hmm. one case of them being uh, crossing a, a linguistic boundary mm -hmm. and identical. <coughs> and that's I think I'll find out from the larger mm -hmm. in the larger studies whether you know I think there are, are, there's a continuum of uh, iconicity or of mm -hmm. uh, a sort of areality mm -hmm. uh, in the same way there is the iconicity. And I haven't found, well, I have found some area ones. So mm -hmm. um, you know this, I'm sure, and other people have worked in West Africa. When something goes on for a long time, you say, you know, ah. uh, yeah. She walked down, ha! <laughs> yes. And there's another one yeah. subtle like that. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. so, you know, this high tone, and that's highly <laughs> iconicity. <laughs> iconicity. <laughs> and, 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 I think I'm, I'm, that's what I'm. That's what I'm hoping to turn up here. Uh, you know that, that there is something like that, uh, but the general answer is no. no. Oh, what about the uh, the idiophones in Creole? Because I'm sure they didn't come in there through English, right? That's, they must have either invented them or picked them up from its own language. Um, they probably invented them. I th I think some. You know, there are a lot of ways <coughs> that idiophones can be derived, like. Um, like, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, okay. uh, uh, so that means, does anybody know Zulu? No, anyway. It means um, something. I think cow is really white. And the word uh, is an idiophone, but it's also a word for snow. But you know, all nouns have a prefix and they're, they're non consistent, so it has morphology when it means snow. But when it appears as an idiophone, it's stripped of all the morphology and it gets an extra high tone as well. So there are internal ways of creating idiophones in the language. I don't know enough about the, the, the uh, idiophones of Creole to really tell you an answer. Do you find hear them in uh, Creole up in, in Oh, so, yeah. Like they, they've got the full set of. Of uh, earphones and they use them a lot. Like yeah. I've heard this. Like for red, it's what? Like, mm -hmm. It's like, why, why do they just, this does not come from Portuguese, right? No. And they, they have like dozens of these things. So, so you know, where did they, I mean, somebody must have felt the need to come up with earphones. Yes. So maybe they brought them there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but you know, in, this, in this paper I wrote about earphones and, and pictures and creoles, uh, it seemed to me that the reason they existed in. Oh, in in uh, in the pigeons, in the resident pigeons, was that these were local languages, and they were uh, idiophones. In my research and Bill Salmon's research and uh, someone else's, um, we found that the more sort of local a person was, the more likely the person was to use idiophones. Mm -hmm. And when the, the the pigeon marked someone's identity uh, or uh, Membership in some sort of social unit that became a, 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 a symbol of that social. Wow. So, um, yeah. so maybe actually, you know, if you phrase your research questions, so not use them as a measurement of competency, but a measurement. No competency of, is wrong. Yeah, it's the wrong word. Kind of claiming a language as a kind of you know identity language, as a patrimony language. Yeah. That yeah. is maybe. I think it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Right. Well, I think um, we have loads, loads for topics for discussion over here. Um, and so we'll free talker and <laughs> move over to the IOE as usual for drinks. And let's thank you again.